Uh, move to our next speaker, uh, Sean Eddy of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and Janelle Farms is here to talk about reading genomes bit by bit. Sean. It's an honor to be here, and it's been a great ride. Um, throughout this project, I w entered graduate school when Renato Del, Be Del Beckel wrote that article about the Human Genome Project and why we should do it, and I've been able to see this from the beginning. Um, I want to convey to you some of the excitement that I feel as we get to look at all this stuff and immerse ourselves in the ACs, Gs, and Ts. And also, I want to uh, talk a little bit about some of the biology besides medicine and besides the human genome. And in the biology parts of the stuff I'm going to talk about, I'm also going to talk about some geekly things about computers and software. But in the biology parts, I'm going to try to explain two things. I'm going to try to explain why not only did we sequence the human genome, but we sequenced a bunch of other things, including lots of flies and lots of worms and lots of other things not just melanogaster, but all around melanogaster, and also things like why did we sequence this particular single-celled pond protozoa and other things like it, and I'll have a little bit about that. Where I'm going to start, though, is at the end of the day, when we look at a DNA sequence, at least if you're a computational geek, you look at the sequence and you see a bunch of ACs, Gs, and Ts, and you say, this is a symbolic sequence. We know a lot about cracking code by both experiment and statistical analysis. Figuring out the meaning of apparently impenetrable languages is something that humans have done for a long time, and it's a great intellectual thing to do. Puzzles are based on this. It gets very addictive. One of the uh, great examples of this is actually uh, described in a book called The Decipherment of Linear B by John Chadwick, writing about his buddy, Michael Ventris, a mathematician at Cambridge. This is an apropos tale. It is 1953 in Cambridge. One code was cracked in the pub, and then another code was also cracked by Ventris. This is Linear B, a language that had been found in Mycenaean caves and was only known in symbols. It's one of the few examples where we didn't know anything about the language. It had to be cracked by direct statistical attack. Ventris's attack was comparative sequence analysis, uh, and the idea was to look for statistical regularities between different tablets. And as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the early successes of comparative sequence analysis. In this case, linear B turns out to be an alternative script for Greek, and so the problem becomes somewhat easier than the problem that we're faced with. But we have a lot of examples, and it's fairly uh, uh, mind-blowing to me still to go to our disks, and what you're seeing on the left unreadably is a listing of the top level of the disks at Genelia Farm where we keep our genomes. And this is like some pre-Victorian phylogenetic tree because you can sort of see algae, amoeba, amphibians, archaea, bacteria in an order that's sort of percolating up and down depending on what my laboratory and I and my wife are working on at any given time. And it's remarkable to me that sort of sitting in these directories are the, is the actual source code to all these different wonderful creatures that, that we see. There is a lot of talk about how much data we're talking about. It is a fair amount of data, but it's not, uh, at least at the moment, completely mind-blowing. For my lab, uh, that disk that I just showed you is about 450 gigs. We have most of the genome sequences that are available. If we were in the business of manipulating human data, if we were taking raw images off an Illumina, that's a lot of data per human genome, and that's difficult to store. It's difficult to ship down the Internet. But once it gets to an assembly, it's not so bad to store it per year. It's not so bad to transmit it down the Internet. And as Eric just mentioned, uh, there's proof of principle that we can store human genomes as differences. And so we know sort of intellectually, sort of in, in, in principle, we know that we can handle the genome for the next couple years, but it's non-trivial. So the 1,000 Genomes Project has generated five terabytes in its pilot project. That's not a big deal. We have a petabyte of spinning disk at Genelia. We could store that if we needed to. The NCBI short read archive is starting to fall over. It's going to be you know, approaching a petabyte soon. But these are volumes of data right now that are not too different than what's you know, uh, your iTunes collection or I've got this up. This is sort of like the Vikings used to drink you know, beer from the skulls of their, of their enemies. Uh, my coffee coaster is, uh, is the Solera genome sequence. 
When we uh, look at this sequence, this is one of the few genome sequences that uh, fits on a slide. This is PHIX-174, sequenced by Sander and Coulson back in the 70s. This sequence, this little bacterial virus, is actually quite interpretable because, of course, there are statistical regularities. There's an ATG start, there's a st one of the three stop codons, there's an open reading frame, and we can walk through a genome like this because a bacterial genome is, tends to be packed with open reading frames, and we can do a pretty good job of interpreting this genome. The, there's interesting stuff going on in the gap, uh, and sometimes there's an interesting little RNA. I'm quite interested in, in little RNAs that have functions, as Eric was also talking about. Once we get into the human genome and the big vertebrate genomes, we have a bit of a problem. Only one, two, three percent of it is coding, depending on who you're talking to. And one of the most important signals that we can try to use is sequence conservation. We line up a bunch of genomes and we say this set of bases is essentially the same across some clade of evolution. Really key in our ability to do this kind of analysis with the human genome was the development of genome browsers by Jim Kent and David Hausler, uh, the Ensemble browser by Ewan Burney, by having the ability to align large quantities of, of genome, which has been done by Webb Miller's group, among others, and then the ability to take those genome alignments and calculate some simple statistic of how conserved do I think the various bits are, generating these plots that you can sort of see in blue that spike out, of course, on the exons, in this case of a single gene, the P53 gene of the human, and then also spiking out on some other areas of non-coding uh, conservation. Adam Siepel's program, FASTCONS, underlies a lot of the calculations that people use for getting a quick look at this conservation. Those little spikes outside exons represent unexpected, well, we expected there to be regulatory sequence. We know there's transcriptional regulatory stuff. We know there's enhancers, there's promoters, there's what have you. But now we can use the conservation to really tell us where that stuff is likely to be. And so that's really the answer to the first sort of biological thing that I said. Why did we sequence so many flies? Why did we sequence so many worms? You can sit down and you can do a power calculation and you can say, okay, what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to count the number of, here's a region of DNA. I've got the human, I've got the mouse. I'm expecting about 40% difference between those two sequences by ne just neutral drift, by evolutionary clock. So if it's 100 nucleotides, I expect 40 differences. I only see 10. Should I be surprised? 10 is a small number. 40 is a small number. You can do a power calculation of, for a given amount of conservation, how much do you have to drive the two distributions apart before you can reliably tell that you've got a conserved piece of DNA given the size of the human genome, which is quite big, so you're going to have false positives. Greg Cooper, Aaron Sadow, and others, and then followed by me, have done those kind of simulations and power studies. And if you want to drive the resolution down to single nucleotides or five or 10 nucleotides, you can pretty quickly convince yourself that for typical distances between vertebrate genomes of like 0.2 to 0.4 substitutions per site, you're going to need tens to even hundreds of genomes lined up. So it's not so much that we're interested in the platys platypus per se, but it's one of the 100 genomes or the 1,000 genomes that we're going to try to line up against the human to try to figure out what's functional in the human. And not just, so that's a very crude calculation. It's conserved, must be doing something interesting. What you can also do is you can look at the pattern of conservation, and you, now you can do much more interesting things. For instance, if you're dealing with a coding region, obviously, there's a pattern of conservation that tends to respect the triplet periodicity of the genetic code. So you can do something like take a region that seems to be conserved. In this case, this is a poster child for a long intergenic non-coding RNA, a gene called SRA1, a gene that when it was first cloned had a truncated cDNA that went to this point, and you'll notice the ATG start code on there. And then you color in where all the mutations are, and you color third position changes red, and then first position's green, second position's blue, and you can see most of the changes here are in red. They're respecting the frame. There's two insertions in the picture that I pulled out, one of six, one of three, again, respecting frame. And when you do this over the entire aligned regions of the SRA1 non-coding RNA, it's pretty clear that this is a coding gene of 232 amino acids in the mouse and 236 amino acids in the human. Now, when the first paper came out, this is 1999, they didn't have as much data as we've got now. And, so, and this, actually, if, you, if we went deeper into the SRI1 story, it gets more and more murky because it does look like the RNA has some, 
has some function uh, independent of the coding region, but, um, but that's a different story. Uh, the, this ability to recognize coding regions and discriminate them from other conservation is something that's now at the heart of a lot of computational gene finding methods that are trying to harness the vertebrate sequences that we have available or the Drosophila sequences that we have available or the Cinerebditis sequences. Work that was really pioneered in bacteria by Jonathan Badger, a graduate student in Gary Olson's lab, but is now sort of fundamental to the field. Now, not just coding regions impose their own evolutionary constraints on sequence, but now once you have that idea, you can say, oh, I expect transcription factors because of the way they contact DNA to show particular patterns of conserved bases and then the middle would not be so conserved because of the way they sort of reach out across and leave a little gap in their conserved binding sites. Or in the case of my laboratory interested in RNAs, you can say there should also be a constraint imposed by RNA secondary structure, at least for structured RNAs, such that I could imagine making a statistical test for you give me a aligned uh, pair of sequences, I can do a statistical test for whether the pattern of changes, here showing four changes, is randomly, randomly distributed, sort of every column is independent, or whether the four positions are respecting frame, they tend to be in the third position, or they tend to be respecting Watson-Crick base pairs, preserving Watson-Crick base pairs in a correlated fashion, which is a feature that we see in lots of structural RNA. You can formalize this, and I'll talk in a, in a few minutes about how we formalize this. There's now a sort of Lego box of tools that we use computationally to build this kind of statistical test for sequence analysis. And you can turn this kind of approach into an RNA gene finder, something that will look now for structural RNAs in conserved regions of whatever genome you're looking at. And it's been very successful in bacteria. Signal noise makes it very problematic in the bigger genomes. But there's been a lot of great work from Ivo Hoffacker and Jakob Peterson and other people in taking this basic approach, which was developed by my wife, Elena, and, and actually get it to scale to the, to the big genomes. And you can, what, one of the things I love about this field is that you can find little subtle effects, sort of the way a hacker will say, well, if I heard you typing on a keyboard, the pattern of spaces between your pauses is informative about what you're typing in so I can figure out your password if I've got a microphone close to you. We can do the same kind of thing for genome sequences. We can look for very subtle things that evolution is putting on the sequence. We can detect those patterns. This is a, uh, just one of many examples I could have pulled. This trick only really works in bacterial genomes. I wish it worked elsewhere. The graph is I'm sweeping across four million bases of E. coli. And I'm going to do a very simple thing. I'm going to count the number of G's I see, and I'm going to count the number of C's I see. And as I just go across the top strand, the Watson strand, and I'm going to plot the excess G's. And what you get is you get that plot. That's very non-random. It's not much. There's an excess of about 20,000 G's as you go across, and then that excess goes away, and then it starts coming back. Turns out that's the terminator, and that's the origin of replication. And remember that E. coli rep replicates like this. And what happens is, there, it's not actually understood why this is, but one of the models is that the lagging strand of replication is more solvent expo exposed and more prone to deamination of the C because that's a water-driven deamination. And so you get a depletion of C on the lagging strand. And that pattern shows up. If you believed that, you'd expect that to also show up for transcription. It happens that E. coli also, its transcription direction respects its replication direction which is probably leading to why this signal is cl so clean in E. coli. Phil Green, Arian Smith, and others have tried to turn this idea into an RNA gene finder. Doesn't work very well with single genomes or pairs of genomes, but it might be that there's enough signal in the mutational biases of transcribed regions that we can use this to find things that have not yet shown up in RNA-seq or epigenome experiments, things where evolution knows that the thing is being transcribed uh, at some point in some single cell that would be difficult to measure experimentally. Now, I also showed you a little picture of a pond ciliate, so now let me get to that part. Once you're looking for little patterns, you don't have to look for just little patterns in all organisms that you think E. coli shares with humans, shares with the worm. You can now say, you know, I can exploit the fact that here's this weirdo creature in some weirdo evolutionary niche that has a weirdo evolutionary pressure. I'm interested in RNAs. 
I can take advantage of this little weird creature to find RNAs and then use homology search to get out of the little weird creature and find homologs in other organisms. So here's an example of the kind of thing you can do once you have tons of genome sequences lying on your disk. You can notice that a, a, a great sort of observational computational biologist, Gene Lowbury, has published a paper where he says, well, I looked at a bunch of bacterial genomes, and I, interested, I, I noticed something interesting. If you plot the optimal growth temperature of the organism versus the GC content of the genome, I sort of expected that the higher the temperature, the more GC-rich the genome would get. But it doesn't happen that way. Bacteria and archaea that grow in high temperatures have other evolutionary adaptations to high temperature other than just strengthening the hydrogen bonds in their DNA. They hold their DNA together by making a reverse gyrase that overwinds the DNA, burns ATP, and puts positive supercoiling into the DNA, and other tricks to stabilize their DNA. But Lobry looked at the, the GC content of structural RNAs. Structural RNAs go off, they make a little single strand, it folds up. Now to stabilize a structural RNA at high temperature, evolution does drive the GC content. And so GC content of the genome is sort of randomly varying, but the structural RNAs tend to be tightly correlated. So if you're an RNA guy, you go, oh, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reach into the, the database, find me the most AT-biased genome that still grows at a super high temperature. The most extreme one you can find is Pyrococcus furiosus. It's isolated from the muck around Volcano Island, Italy. I actually know some of the people who have the... the, the, the benefit of being able to go in their scuba gear and collect on the Italian islands. This thing grows at 98 degrees C, 60% 60, 60 AT genome. It is not something you would think of as an experimental organism. It dies in, in trace oxygen. It's a strict anaerobe. Grows on elemental sulfur, generates uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, nobody likes you in the, in the floor that you're working on. Um, it does have the advantage that because its normal growth temperature is 98 C, you don't need uh, uh, minus 70 to store your samples. You just put it on the bench, and it thinks that's minus 70. <laughs> um, but what you can do with its genome, so the easy part is looking at its genome sequence because that was done by not us. Uh, we could just reach into the databases and then say, okay, this is a Perl script sweeping across its genome, just counting GCs in Windows, and there's two tRNAs. So finding structural RNAs in this organism is completely trivial. And when you, when you do this, you find a bunch of uh, little RNAs, tens of structural RNAs that had not been discovered before, all of which were in known classes. So this was unable to discover novel classes of structural RNAs for uh, bacteria or archaea. And then you say, okay, one of our big problems in interpreting genomes is that we don't know where a gene stops and a gene starts. So when I'm looking at just regulatory stuff, I don't know when the enhancer is for this gene, or I don't know when it's for that gene, or in, indeed whether it's transvecting over to some other chromosome. Um, and if I'm looking for structural RNAs, I have a problem of just finding them in the first place. The statistical signals are pretty uh, uh, subtle. So this is an, uh, uh, some ongoing work from a student in my lab, Sil Kyung Jung, working in collaboration with Laura Landweber's lab at Princeton, working with an organism that was pioneered by David Prescott at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I, was a graduate student there, and I've always held this organism in my head as this organism is going to be useful for something someday. <laughs> its adaptation is a bizarre one. It has in its macronucleus, it actually has two different kinds of nucleus, nuclei, and I won't go into all the biology, it has a macronucleus that's a somatic transcribed nucleus, and in the macronucleus it has about 20,000 different chromosomes. There's actually several million chromosomes. The average chromosome size is two kilobases, and these are individual chromosomes, telomere, gene, telomere, telomere, gene, telomere, telomere, gene, telomere, extra gene. For the most part, not completely, unfortunately, but for the most part, this organism has identified all of its genes for us and put telomeres at the end, ends of them. And so now we can just sequence the genome and say, well, that's a gene, that's a gene, that's a gene. And since protein genes are relatively obvious, not completely, but relatively obvious, we can do a subtractive screen. We can say, throw away all the proteins, who cares? Everything else is either an interesting gene that we didn't know about or a structural RNA or something like that. And that screen has gone and has identified a small number, again, of new RNAs. So let me close with a couple words about geekly things. Forgive, forgive me. But underlying all of this is computer science, statistics, mathematics that's being used to interpret these genome sequences. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we, we start with a sequence and we draw these cartoons where we say, okay, the sequence is a line, and we're trying to attach labels. 
I could show you a protein sequence, and these could be domains, in this case of the Dicer protein, which was actually done by sequence analysis. Brenda Bass wrote a review where she said, okay, based on what we know about RNA interference, it's got to have an RNA helicase activity, it's got to have this, it's got to have that, and it turns out there's only one protein in C. elegans that has the right combination of domains of known function, and that protein turned out to be Dicer, and so that was an important computational clue in the early days of RNA interference. But I could be drawing a DNA sequence and enhancers. You know, this is how we draw things, exons, introns. We're trying to al attach labels to sequences. That is, you show me a piece of sequence, what I'm really interested in, what label do I attach to that piece of sequence? The label is hidden, and I'm trying to infer, should it be this label or that label? And it turns out that there's a big field of mathematics in digital signal processing and speech recognition that does this for whether it's a speech signal or whether it's an encrypted signal or whether it's the telemetry off of your car engine, which actually uh, uh, I could tell you a story about how those guys are now using software developed in bioinformatics to do prototyping of engine telemetry and uh, astronomical telemetry, which is amazing. The field has sort of gone full circle because we've put so much work now into adopting methods called hidden Markov models and stochastic context-free grammars and other methods, probability models of attaching labels to sequences that are appropriate either for linear sequence analysis where you just say, okay, I'm just gonna do a sequence alignment, or in the case of RNA, I'm gonna align pairs in a sort of nested set. We have models to do that. They were introduced in the 90s by Gary Churchill, Gary Stormo, Andres Krogh, David Hausler. SCFG models for RNA is introduced by Yasu Sakakibara and myself at about the same time. Yasu was in David's lab at the time. And this has given us a real toolkit to build models, which gives me an opportunity to say that the most important tool in computational biology, without doubt, is the tool called BLAST, and it's probably familiar to all of you. BLAST does a sequence alignment between a query that you give it and the, every sequence in the database, and it looks for things that are significantly related. When we look at the BLAST algorithm as probabilistic modelers, we say, okay, this is an approximation. For, it's a two-level approximation. But, well, it's a multi-level approximation. It's doing sequence alignment where what it's trying to do is attach a label saying these two residues are aligned or these two residues are not aligned. This is an insertion. This is a deletion. And so it has three states. It says I'm either going to try to align residues X and Y or I'm going to throw X out as an insertion or I'm going to throw Y out as a, as a deletion, so as an insertion on the other strand. Those are three states that I can move between. That's a Markov model. I, where I go next is dependent on where I just was. And so I have hidden states that I'm trying to infer connected by arrows. That's a hidden Markov model. But the arrows in BLAST are associated with mostly zeros implicitly. And then there's a gap open penalty every time I open an insertion, either way. And there's a gap extend penalty every time I extend an insertion by another residue on, a, on either strand. And then there's a score for aligning the two residues that's due to the Blossom matrix from the Hanikoffs. The bottom line is we now understand that those zeros really should be probabilities, or at least if you're thinking in this sort of probabilistic inference context, and we can represent BLAST's internal model as a probability model. And now we can do things like, well, instead of just giving me the optimal alignment, sum over all possible alignments, and then tell me what's the probability that you're really confident that this residue aligns to this residue integrated over all possible alignments, and other things. The field has been trying to do that for a while, and now I want to make a somewhat uh, sociological point. There are, there's lots of research and a big literature on developing better methods for sequence analysis. Those methods go into journals like BMC Bioinformatics and what have you, and none of you read them. Then there's another uh, field which takes very important algorithms and then reduces them down to their bare bones and speeds them up on particular hardware. Uh, uh, and there's lots you can do on modern ha hardware. For instance, this paper from Michael Farrar, who was, until his untimely death a couple months ago, unfortunately, our, our chief software engineer. I recruited him from Boston. Notice, unaffiliated, this is also a sociological comment. He was not in a university. He did this particular paper in his spare time and then was recruited by both Bill Pearson and me to actually become a biologist. So you can use SIMD, what's called single instruction multiple data, being driven by the graphics industry. All modern chips are capable of vector parallelized processing. They're being driven to this by all the games everybody plays. You can take advantage of those instruction sets to make bioinformatics software. But the question is, who's going to do it? 
The difference between writing a piece of software that works for your BMC bioinformatics paper and a piece of software that runs fast and it can be used by the rest of the community is an enormous difference. And it's to blast credit that one of the things that's underlying that is not only terrific theory from Stephen Altshul and Sam Carlin and others, and great algorithmics from Gene Myers and Warren Gish and others, but terrific software engineering from the NCBI team. It's very rare to get that kind of investment in a piece of software, and that's really one of the things that makes BLAST fast. Frankly, in our lab, we are frustrated that BLAST was written 20 years ago, and it's now difficult to adapt it to the stuff that we think we know with probability modeling now. There's an effort in my lab to now take the hidden Markov model methods and speed them up to BLAST. And we've inve been investing a lot of time in this uh, to get the engineering up to, up to snuff. One of our goals is for you to be able to do an HMM-based search, like a BLAST search, on a web server where you get the response no matter what the size of the NR database in 100 milliseconds or less. That is faster than a Google search so that you can do interactive searching rather than waiting for a batch job and actually start exploring what sequence space looks like in all these wonderful organisms. And we're within an order of magnitude of being able to do that. Again, reinforcing the point, I don't want to uh, belabor this, but we have been working to engineer tools that can do this kind of probability uh, analysis. The point I want to make on this slide is the difference between a tool that runs good enough for a publication, I could probably write Hammer in a thousand lines of C code. The actual code, which is not as good as we want, is 44,000 lines and similarly. So we maintain a big code base um, trying to make this stuff useful and that requires engineering. But it also means that I have a two-faced view of what we're looking at, and it's uh, sort of not great for one's mental health at times, but we are very much immersed in two levels of code. One, the level of looking at all these wonderful genome sequences, but also the level of our C code of trying to interpret all that, and both of those are evolutionary artifacts that are difficult to understand. And with that, I'll stop. And in contrast, and now a sort of counterpoint to Eric's world, um, my little lab, uh, which is a husband and wife team. Uh, we've been working together for longer than we've been uh, together as, as a couple. A uh, very small laboratory at Genelia Farm uh, where we're pretty much dedicated to building these kind of tools uh, for the community to use. And I'd, I'll stop and I'd be happy to take questions. We have time for a quick question. If someone's going to race to a microphone, is that someone racing to a microphone or racing out the door? Racing out the door. Okay. So in that case, Sean will be available at the break. We're going to take a break now. Then I'm sure he'll talk to you if you have any questions. 